Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the LK99 show, apparently. Uh, it's your boy, it's Renald, uh, back with an update, a follow-up video to yesterday's video. Um, if you don't know what LK99 is or what superconductivity is or why this is a big deal or the underlying story behind all of this that's going on, please do check out that previous video. I'll put it in the top right. Um, but uh, this is the update for today, which is August uh, the second Wednesday, 2023. Um, so <clears throat> the biggest piece of news that we have today uh, that we need to discuss is basically the measurement of zero resistance. So this is the primary thing that we were kind of waiting on as of yesterday evening. Um, we kind of have it a little bit. Uh, at the very least, some of the picture is starting to be better elucidated. This is a uh, study out of Southwest University in China. Uh, this came this came out like in the early hours, I believe, of the of the morning, uh, at least where I'm in in the United States. Uh, so this basically is a study that measured that the um, resistance of the material uh, dropped significantly uh, uh, below a temperature of 110. The actual paper uh, phrases it as above 100, which is true. Uh, but really the range that it was superconducting the most in was between 100 and 110. Kelvin. Kelvin. So let, let me be clear about that. Kelvin is 273 degrees below Celsius by definition. And zero Kelvin means zero, zero, like no heat whatsoever. It's absolute zero. So 110 Kelvin is still quite cold. It's warmer than most superconductors that we have right now. It would be the second best ambient pressure uh, superconductor at that temperature. <clears throat> However, this is not by any means the whole story. So if you look at the actual curve that they generated for the resistance measurement, um, there were a couple of interesting features there. One, there was this weird sharp sudden drop at around the 250 Kelvin mark, um, which it wasn't zero resistance, so there was like almost an order of magnitude plus um, a drop in resistance at around 250 Kelvin, um, but even if you if you take that amount of resistance there, it's not near zero. It wasn't super conducting at 250. So just I want to clarify that. I saw some posts on Twitter saying that it had like a drop to zero at 250. It did not because it comes right back up shortly after that and continues this um, descent that never has a sharp drop that you normally expect um, for especially type one superconductors. Type two superconductors sometimes have a mixed state. We'll come back to that near the end, but. There was no, in the original LK99 paper, uh, in the Korean paper, they did observe a, a, a relatively sharp drop. It wasn't like, like that, but it was, it was pronounced. Whereas in this, it just kind of slowly came down to a resistance of, it should be noted, about 10 to the negative uh, fifth or negative sixth ohms, um, which is what they report as near zero. Remember, as we talked about in the previous video, that superconduction doesn't necessarily imply absolute undetectable resistance, it is near zero. And this is what they're reporting as near zero. Uh, but once again, at 110. Um, and so this would maybe suggest like a heterogeneous sample, like there's a bunch of different crystal structures in the sample. Oh yeah, and we should, we should um, talk about the sample itself. So they say that they were able to, using x-ray uh, diffraction uh, crystallography, make a uh, characterize their sample as purer than the Korean sample. Uh, in other words, the <clears throat> uh, peaks correlating uh, with impurities were less in their sample. Um, however, it's not clear whether they had the copper substituting at the right lead position, um, which we kind of mentioned in the last video, but to re-update here, um, the structure of uh, LK99 is like a lead appetite uh, lattice that has copper uh, substituted at certain points uh, where the lead would normally be, um, <clears throat> which causes the whole structure to deform and allows it to uh, withstand or superconduct at higher pressures and temperatures. They seem to say that they have less impurities, but somehow have not replicated the same um, properties that the Koreans are uh, reporting. There's potential reasons for this, we'll come back to that later, but uh, basically, they, they found that they made multiple samples. Most of these were uh, semiconductors, by the way. Why is that? So the theoretical studies, which once again, we're gonna come back to after this, <clears throat> suggest that if the copper substitutes at the wrong lead position and it's 
by the way, more thermodynamically favored to do so, which is why most of the samples are coming out as semiconductors and only one out of maybe eight or 10 or worse uh, are coming out as superconductors. This is because there's that thermodynamic favorability for the semiconductor version of this. So what they did was they made a, a, a bulk sample and then they crushed it up and, and they took the specs that were levitating. So they have not actually shown that they have more of the right structure they're just choosing for what should be the right structure based on its properties. So that's another thing that we need to clarify right there. Um, so ideally, even though they say there's less impurities, we don't know whether it's exactly the correct thing until they characterize it further, um, which their paper is in preprint right now. So we have to wait for it to be, you know, be, they're, they're probably going to characterize it further before they actually go ahead and get this published. Um, so other things to mention. Uh, that this is uh, they, they, an interesting property that isn't fully explained just yet, um, but is apparently seen in some other superconductors. I, I heard that, but I don't know that. Uh, it, when you apply a magnetic field to it, based on the strength of that magnetic field, that critical temperature that they uh, observed either goes down or up. As you raise the field, that temperature is modified down, and then it's modified up. Um, which is odd. Uh, uh, supposedly, they say that they do not explain that. Other people have said that they've seen that before. I don't know. If you've seen it before, please comment down if you happen to know uh, anything more about that that I don't. Another thing that I wanted to point out is that the, the temperature resistance curve is quite different from the original paper. Um, so because of this difference, you almost got to wonder, maybe were some of the impurities important? Maybe Maybe it was too pure or just the sample, like the heterogeneous crystals, maybe the structure of one crystal versus the other, even with the same x-ray diffraction uh, profile, uh, has totally different properties. So we don't know that very well. Um, so they measured the resistance. They also tried to measure Meissner effect and, and the uh, diamagnetism. So remember, a superconductor should have, be like a perfect diamagnet perfectly expelling magnetic fields from inside of it. This exhibited poor diamagnetism, which is interesting because they surmise that the superconductivity of the substance uh, based on this must be a limited contributor, um, which is in opposition to some of the other things that we've seen because other replication attempts have actually found good diamagnetism, uh, but higher resistivity. Maybe that was one of the semiconductors that comes out of this, um, or once again, a different crystal structure than what they actually came up with here may be the one that actually has the properties that the original authors were claiming to uh, have. Once again, we're still waiting for a, well, their sample to be analyzed. Um, now, I would say that, you know, the non-hype interpretation of this is that this test of a sample that has been synthesized in China did not show room temperature superconductivity. Um, but a couple caveats to that. One, even if this ends up being the most interesting thing that comes out of this. Um, it's not nothing, right? This is an ambient pressure superconductor at 110 Kelvin um, by a mechanism that we didn't previously know. And uh, under the theory that would say, you know, what explains this, this is potentially what we call a one-dimensional superconductor. So we'll come back to that briefly when we talk about the history later. Um, and the other thing I would say is that I really doubt this is the end of it. So far, we have multiple replication attempts, and each one of them has kind of been pretty darn different. And I think the manufacturing process and the actual um, getting the exact crystal structure that you want, we really got to work on that. I think what they've been working on for the past multiple years in Korea, before, you know, before publishing this paper, is trying to get a better yield and trying to get the exact right crystal structure that they actually want. Um, and that seems to be a problem right now. So I don't think the story is done here. I don't think that, you know, we gotta see more studies like this, measuring the resistance of different samples, because it seems to be that we're getting very heterogeneous results. So we need an explanation for that. Um, let's talk about the theoretical basis behind all of this. So uh, one comment on the previous video, which I, I thought was a good thing to mention, is ECAT, like the previous cold fusion experiments that we've seen that have all turned out to be bogus, they were just wrong. The big thing about that I think in my mind right now separates this, uh, there's a couple things that separate this, but the big thing is that we have some theoretical basis um, based in current physics, in, based in our current in silico simulations to potentially explain why this might work. 
Um, and Cold Fusion had none of that, right? Cold Fusion, it was just a mystery. It was just a hand wavy, hey, look, we got more energy, we don't know how. Whereas we now have four papers that are now, so one out of China, one out of Boulder, Colorado, one out of a, is a, combina is a collaboration within China and Austria, and then one out of Berkeley. We, the Berkeley one I kind of mentioned in the, I think, I think I mentioned in the last video, in the comment, the pin comment of that video, I mentioned a couple more of these, but let me go through them and just the basic uh, things that we can take away from them. Andrew Cote, uh, the engineer on Twitter, I'm gonna link that below. He has a much more detailed, better explanation of this. I am not uh, a, ma a magnet engineer or a physicist or anything, and I don't pretend to be. Uh, um, and this one dimensionality may actually be a potential explanation for why we're not seeing that convincing Meissner effect. Remember that initial video that I, re I initially posted and said that this doesn't look convincing at all. It doesn't look like really the Meissner effect. Part of it is going like down and touching the, the magnet. That might potentially be a, a, a po possible explanation. Um, this, this one dimensional theory, it may not actually be super conductive in every um, in direction. Um, so that's another thing that we're gonna be looking into. Also, another thing that I thought was absolutely fascinating is that these theoretical papers suggest potential improvements, right? So LK99 hasn't even been uh, verified as being real all the way yet. It's looking more promising because we're seeing that, yes, there's a temperature where it's zero resistance, and yes, there's samples that can show Meissner effect, or, or diamagnetism at the very least, a really strong diamagnetism, um, which some have suggested probably is Meissner effect. Um, but we have potential improvements before we've even verified that because our, uh, our physics gives us possibilities. Specifically, substituting gold where we're currently trying to put the copper may actually yield uh, better superconducting properties. Um, also, there's a possible interaction with silver if you put silver there instead, um, but it's, it's apparently it behaves differently from the actual copper one, so they didn't actually go into detail of what that means, whether that's actually still superconductor or just a different type of interaction. Um, and then nickel and zinc probably perform worse. Uh, for whatever reason, there's apparently a team that's now going to try and replicate this, but with zinc, even though, I don't know, now, they must not have seen this paper where the, uh, the zinc might be worse, because apparently it was already in process, they already started their synthesis with the zinc instead, so they must have not they must have, that must have started before this paper came out. Um, next, uh, I wanted to do a real quick update on the Varda team. Uh, so I did mention that that might have been Tuesday. Apparently I got that wrong. It's gonna be late Thursday when their uh, cook is done and their reactions are set and they're ready to potentially start posting uh, floating rock videos. Uh, so they said either very late Thursday or early Friday is gonna be when they start posting more of their results. So this is the Varda engineering team at that, that space company uh, with Andrew McCaleb. So I'm, you know, going to watch and see. Um, remember that, uh, you know, multiple replication attempts are going to be necessary uh, and the yield on this is pretty low. So there's a, po there's a good possibility he may not come up with anything interesting, um, but I'm still excited to see it. Uh, and then I've been alluding to the historical uh, aspect of this story. Uh, once again, we're fleshing out what's probably going to show up in the HBO show and the Netflix show and the movie and whatever the heck else gets made about this. If this pans out, I'm sure there'll be documentaries, movies, everything over the next decade or two extensively. Um, but basically it looks like this, um, so remember um, the initial that Lee and, and Kim had their uh, professor who came up with this theory, T.S. Chair, uh, who was into one-dimensional superconductors. It looks like we can trace that theory further back beyond T.S. Chair. Um, so he apparently had an, art, an interview where he talked about where he got his ideas from. Apparently there is a Polish guy uh, who he studied with, and that Polish guy himself got his ideas from a, a scientist from the Soviet Union. What's interesting is apparently what happened is the Soviet guy was researching these one-dimensional superconductors and he was looking into exactly this type of thing that we're seeing right now. However, then the USSR fell and he lost his funding and there was no more research on it. You gotta, gotta kind of almost wonder like what if the USSR like hung out for just a little bit longer. Imagine if they found this back then 
and we didn't have it then and the internet wasn't able to like disseminate this the way it is right now, wouldn't that be something? That alternate timeline where they discover LK-99 back in the day and then, you know, the, the Cold War gets completely turned in their favor. Um, but that's interesting because um, Iris GB, that uh, the Russian molecular uh, biologist who, uh, physiologist who did that first Twitter reproduction that got everybody all up in arms, uh, she called this, you know, a, a Soviet predicted, you know, uh, science that's predicted by Soviet theories. And technically she's right. I would not heard of that before, but that is the case. The last thing I'm going to leave you with, uh, last thing I promise, is just bullshit, probably, right? I'm just going to throw this out there because this is a total coincidence and I'm sure this is nonsense, right? Taj Quantum, a company based out of Florida, has apparently acquired a patent. This is, we can look it up, patent 172-49094. Uh, I'm going to put their website in the description. Heck, why not? Uh, they claim to have also developed a room temperature superconductor. They have the patent as of the 25th of last month. Their press release came out on the 31st, like a couple days ago. And they say that they now also have a room temperature superconductor based on graphene foam technology that also superconducts up to 130 degrees Celsius and is a type 2 superconductor um, invented by these two guys. Uh, quick explanation, type 2 versus type 1 superconductors. Type 1s are usually the single metals like mercury where you just, um, uh, they have a sudden transition and then if you raise the magnetic field or whatever, they suddenly transition away. There is an intermediate state that they can go into, but the big thing that separates them from the type 2 superconductors is that they are typically single metals and they have that abrupt transition. Type 2 superconductors have an intermediate state that is sometimes called the vortex state where they have some properties of a superconductor and some they don't. Um, so this is supposedly a graphene-based room temperature superconductor. These guys say that they want to open source the process and get everybody involved. So far they've released nothing, absolutely nothing, zero. No data, no papers, no nothing. So this is, you know, I just thought I'd mention it because it's coming up coincidentally right now and supposedly I have a patent, uh, which should be publicly available maybe. Um, but uh, I'm sure this is, I'm sure this is. I mean, nobody's even talking about this. This is, you know, it's just a weird coincidence to have two completely different syntheses of a room temperature superconductor in like the same week. Just thought I'd mention it. Like and subscribe. Thank you.